Hey, it's Kendrick. And so today I have the honor of sitting down with a different type of uh, a security professional. So this is Corey White, CEO and co-founder of Savitar. And also a little bit of a personal thing because Corey is actually my, my first cousin. So which mm -hmm. means my mother and his father are brother and sister. So this is an honor for me to be able to actually sit down and interview on my YouTube channel, my cousin, who has served as a mentor for me. Now, Corey, you have a very extensive like history in cybersecurity. Yes. You didn't just like start a company. And so the po point of my YouTube channel is to encourage people to get into cybersecurity mm -hmm. and to give them tools and inspiration and everything necessary to get them to take those steps to become cybersecurity professionals. But let's go ahead and let's back up just a little bit because mm -hmm. I had a bit of a misconception about you and how you got to where you were. So for me growing up, you know, it was my big cousin, Corey, and, you know, Corey aced every test and he, you know, crossed every T and dotted every I. But we were having a conversation a couple of days ago mm -hmm. and you kind of informed me that you were very different. And I guess the thing is we never really sat down and kind of talk like we right. did the other night. Right. So you were telling me a little bit about your views and how college and stuff like that. So for all the people that are trying to get into cybersecurity and they may not be your stereotypical great test taker and stuff like that. Tell me a little bit about your history, mm -hmm. college, and the path that you took towards cyber, becoming a cybersecurity professional and ultimately CEO and co-founder of Cybertar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. It, what I talk about now is not what I used to talk about. So that's why I didn't tell mm -hmm. you all that stuff back in the day. Uh -huh. But you get, get a little bit older and you, you start just living your truth, your authentic self. Mm -hmm. Not that I was necessarily hiding it. I just wanted to you know, just talk about my experience so people mm -hmm. could actually learn from it. Yes. So you know, in college, I actually intentionally was a C student. I did not actually strive to have that 4.0 because what I realized in college, I had actually a, a, a pretty good friend of mine and he was an amazing people person. Mm -hmm. And so we would go anywhere, he would strike up conversations and, and then I had, had a girlfriend who was an amazing people person as well. And I wasn't that great at that. Okay. And so I, I spent time in the computer lab and studying. I, I looked at the other people in the computer lab. They were not great people um, persons either. They could not actually <laughs> communicate very well. And so I started noticing the power of being able to communicate. And I figured I need to know how to do that. That was way more powerful relationships, but way more powerful than having a 4.0. And also, I looked at some of the best, um, you know, computer programming. I'm dating myself completely. Uh, we were programming in COBOL, and that's very, very old language. But uh, back in the '90s, but I realized that I don't want to be like that COBOL programmer that could sit there and just program but could not communicate. Mm -hmm. So I actually had did a shift in college. Uh, about halfway through, I, I, I stopped focusing as much on the grades themselves, and I started focusing on building relationships, getting to know people, and learning more about life than, than actually you know, the grades. So <clears throat> I actually intentionally graduated with a 2.0 in college. <laughs> That, that was I the, think most of us would think that's a little bit low. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that, you know, I tried to go a little bit higher, but at the end of the day, I just needed to get a degree. That was my mindset, to get, get that paper. And so once I did that, then, um, but it doesn't back up a little bit. The other thing, while I was getting that 2.0, I was working on my interpersonal skills. I also became president of the business fraternity. With the 2.0? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I had to make sure that you actually could do it with that GPA and, and, and you actually could. So, um, but that's where I learned to run, run a chapter, run a business, uh, because it was like a business. Um, and those skills, at least for me personally, mm -hmm. were way more important than, than learning a, a programming language. Because anybody that's ever programmed, you realize that programming is just logic. And so you can just logically think through that. And the language itself is not that hard. Now you fast forward to today, you don't actually need to know how to program. Agreed. <laughs> so it, it's interesting that uh, I'm glad I figured it out 20 something years ago that, hey, I want to learn business skills, people skills versus programming. So you're, you're, you're leading the business fraternity with a 2.0 GPA. You made these interpersonal 
uh, mm -hmm. these relationships and develops your interpersonal skills. Yep. So how does this translate? Because I can tell you that I graduated with a 2.8. <laughs> okay. I had too much fun in the beginning. It was a great student yeah. at the end. Yeah. And it kind of uh, eliminated opportunities like Raytheon and other companies who I could have done the work. Right. wouldn't even look at me with that GPA at a 2.8. Mm -hmm. And that means, and I made presidents and deans list the last two years of school consistently, but it still wasn't enough to get me a look because they had a hard 3.0. Right. So how did you, how did you use those skills and the 2.0 GPA to be able to work your way into the companies? You can tell us about some of the companies you work for, which are yep. very recognizable names. Yep. Yep. It, it's interesting. So, um, I moved to Dallas after I graduated, uh, started interviewing around, and it was actually amazing timing because it, I was there in August of 1995. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are, that are older, August 24th, 1995 was a big, big date. That's when Windows 95 came out. Okay. <laughs> so I, when it came out, I was supporting Windows 95, uh, working uh, indirectly for Microsoft and, mm -hmm. and doing support. And so I came out of college and I was exposed to the internet, but in college, the internet really didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So 95, I, everything I learned in college really didn't matter. Like mm -hmm. I definitely wasn't going to be a COBOL programmer. And, and so when I started supporting Internet Explorer 1.0, Exchange 1.0, all these brand new you know, pieces of software, I'll never forget we, when they, we were learning about the internet and you know, there's this file called cookies. I'm like, we're like, what is cookies? So we had to figure out all these new things, IP addressing, all this was brand new. So, you know, for me, I had to get, you know, certifications and, and start working and learning outside of, of um, college. But getting that job was actually pretty interesting. Um, it was a support position. They never asked what the GPA was. Really? Yeah, they never asked. And, um, Obviously, I didn't share, <laughs> but um, it, it was interesting. I got that job, but it, let me tell, talk about my next job because it's actually pretty interesting. I started learning about myself, and one of the things I encourage everybody to do today is learn about yourself, get to know yourself, because that, that's how you figure out what you do in life. So in that support position, I was able to, I knew the answers to everything after a few months. I could do the job with with, you know, I had my headphones on for support with the mic. I had another uh, headphone on listening to music in one ear. And, and so with, with, you know, Windows 95 is either reinstall or reboot nine times out of 10. Yeah. A few times there was a few fixes here and there. Uh, but I had that just down to a science. So I was absolutely bored. Like I could work listen to music and kind of multitask on, on the internet. It wasn't much to browse on the internet in 95, but the few things that were there, I could do that. So I, I realized I'm actually bored. I need something that is dynamic. The other thing, this is an interesting point of, uh, and people can look up in the old yearbooks, but in high school, mm -hmm. I was voted most likely to be seen sleeping in class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can relate to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but here, let me, let me, here's why. Like, I'm a night person, definitely not a morning person. And, and at the same time, I'm always trying to learn something new. And I don't want to sleep. I want to mm. keep learning something new. So, school, even in high school, was a little boring to me. Mm -hmm. And so, to literally have to sit there and hear somebody tell you stuff and you just read the book and figure it out. So nine times out of 10, I was seen sleeping in class. <laughs> so it, it, it just it is not about, it, at least in my opinion, the education. It's, it, to me, it's more about the hustle and, and what you do outside of that. So once I realized I'm bored out of my mind doing this support position, I need to have something more dynamic. So literally, I'm looking through the newspaper, because <laughs> that's where jobs were back in the day. Uh, looking through the newspaper on, on weekends and faxing resumes, uh, and I wanted to find like a consulting job because I knew that's different. You're learning different things. So I found this, uh, uh, this job and I started uh, interviewing for it. I go in for the interview and it was for an associate network uh, systems engineer. And so it was a starter position and I didn't know much about networking. You know, I was trying to, I was studying 
for my uh, uh, Novell Network CNA at, at the time. And that was using um, IPX and not IP addresses. So yeah, I was learning some stuff there, but it's just not the same. So <clears throat> I, I go in for the interview and I'll never forget this. Uh, except I forget the little test yet, but I think we've seen this before. So he says, all right, I know networking is new to you, but I want you, here's a whiteboard, here are some markers, and I'm gonna screw this up, but you guys will get the gist. He's like, all right, you got some sticks, you got uh, a squirrel, and you got you know five apples, or something like that. It is, and it said, and you gotta get all of them across the stream, but you can't carry it all at the same time. So you gotta figure out, work how to do it, work out how to do it on, on the whiteboard. And I know I probably totally screwed up that scenario, but I get up and I start working through it, and I start working through it, and I was, I was about to figure it out. And then he says, stop. I'm like, and I'm like, damn, why was it? I'm not gonna stop. And so I, uh, I kept going and, and then uh, he said, no, 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 stop, that's it. And I was like, God, damn, I'm not gonna get this job because I didn't figure this thing out, this, this riddle or whatever. And so then he, uh, he said, okay, we talked a little bit more and interview was over. I was like, all right, I guess I'll keep searching. A few days later, he calls me up and says, you got the job. And I was like, wow, okay, all right, cool. So I had my first consulting job. So I never forget, we um, went to lunch and <laughs> literally we went to lunch at Wendy's. So I met Wendy's and I think his name was Rick. I said, Rick, that interview, like, how did I get the job? I didn't figure the thing out. And he said, Corey, you don't understand. I probably interviewed 25, 30 people. And some wouldn't even get out of the seat. They're like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't figure it out. Um, others, they started and they just, just gave up. Once I saw you got further than anybody else, and you were logically trying to figure it out, I'm like, that's our guy. And so that actually blew my mind. Like I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that people wouldn't even try. Yeah. They would not even get up. I can't either, not for a job interview. Not for a job interview, right? Um, and, and so that's how I got the job. But if you think about what I said earlier, it's about knowing yourself, right? And one of the things I've always been good at is logically figuring things out. I love that. That's, that's one of the things I love. So I'm not going to back down from a challenge. And you take that and you equate that to life. How will you um, make it through life if you're not even going to get up? You're not even going to show up. But that's how I got my first networking job. And that's you know, ultimately how I got into security. I can tell more you know, about how to turn into security. But that was my first networking job. And then cybersecurity came along with it. I started putting in firewalls and doing assessments and all that stuff. But that's how it started. Okay. And I know during your career, you've, you've worked for some really awesome companies and uh, traveled all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, what I recall is that, you know, my, my image of Corey was, man, you're constantly jumping on a plane, running in to save these companies who, <laughs> who were breached. Uh, because yeah. I think for a while you were doing breach remediation. And I don't know if that was part of McAfee mm -hmm. Foundstone or... Um, it was actually pretty much throughout my career it is interesting. Uh, back in the 90s when I started doing cybersecurity, it, you, it, was, it was interesting. You could be the security guy and know everything about cybersecurity, okay? Because it wasn't that complicated at the time. Mm -hmm. you, know, you didn't have cloud security, application security. You didn't have all that stuff. Uh -huh. So we were able to, um, I was able to just kind of be that Swiss Army knife, jack of all trades. But in, in consulting, especially in those days, um, you just had to figure it out. I mean, I remember one of uh, back, I think it was like 97, um, I was working in California at the time and we had a uh, guy, it was actually into it. They were putting together the TurboTax network in uh, San Diego. Okay. And so um, I was, uh, our office was in um, Costa Mesa, California, so about an hour north. And I never forget the the you know managing consultant said, Corey, you know how to do a load balancer? And I was like, No, but I'll figure it out. Yeah. And and so he said, All right, cool. Next thing I know, that we're building the TurboTax network and I'm figuring out how to do the load balancers to load balance the traffic as it's coming in, because a certain number of tax returns had to come in every single second. 
And so I had the load balancers across it. And load balancers were brand new. Cisco had uh, just come out with the, the I think it was called the local director. And you had to figure it out. So I'm sitting there with the manual, figuring out how to load balance the, the TurboTax network. So when you, you, you think about it, like that was a big deal to figure that out, but that was an important job because once the traffic came in, I had to balance across all these web servers. So um, I just had a lifetime of just figure it out. And I guess the point around that is that you have to not shy away from these things and just go toward the challenge. And so that's how I got into incident response because you know in, inevitably we had companies that had compromises and I was a security guy, go figure it out. Yeah. So you didn't have all these these amazing classes that they have now about how to do incident response and forensics and stuff like that. You kind of had to build no. that script yourself. A hundred percent. So what's interesting about that? I um, so the classes, the books, all that stuff really didn't exist, and the few that did exist, they were expensive. So I couldn't really afford to you know buy all the books. So uh, Barnes and Noble. I would, sorry, Barnes and Noble. I would go and sit in Barnes and Noble, read the books, and take notes, and study, and not actually buy the books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's how I, I see started. a trend here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's or how I got. Here. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got a lot of my certifications because, um, again, the books were really expensive. They were a lot of certifications I needed to get. Um, I didn't learn it in college because they didn't teach it. It was not even available. So. I had to learn IP addressing and subnetting. Um, and so the certifications I was getting and had at the time, um, I got you know my MCSE, MCSE plus security, uh, MCSE plus internet. I, I um, actually, my company did pay for me to go to SANS a few times. So I had uh, several SANS certifications, uh, you know, the incident response one, the, um, uh, the, the standard GIAC one, but I had about four or five SANS certifications. Uh, but I had to study for all of those at night. And one thing I'll tell people is that my 20s, I spent sitting in usually like a Denny's because, again, the sleeping thing, I can't just sit and read. I would get bored and fall asleep if I sat at home. So sat in Denny's and had their endless coffee. And sometimes I ate the, the Grand Slams for hours and studied. Those were my nights in the 20s. And so I was building a foundation so that now you know you know a couple of years later i'm actually able to leverage that knowledge and and so a lot of people in in their 20s they'll spend that you know hanging out going out or whatever like i spent mine learning because i was not taught in school um cyber security you know networking this is all new the internet was new so i had to keep learning so i built that me mentality of a lifetime of learning I knew about Foundstone doing incident response because this is when I started. I just started, I guess, becoming an endpoint administrator for my company. Mm -hmm. And so we had some issues. This is where we were dealing with root kits and those type yep. of things. Yep. And uh, I became very familiar with sending McAfee samples because there was all kind of stuff that was coming through <laughs> yeah. that was hitting the desktop. It was not hitting any of the perimeter firewall filters yep. and stuff. And so I learned about McAfee Foundstone uh, and then I learned that you were there. Uh -huh. But I never had any idea that when it came to a lot of the services that were provided by Foundstone that you were kind of the mastermind or the creator behind yeah. those services. So a few things. Um, I'm going to come to that, but I want to say an important point. Um, one of my favorite books now, and I'm looking back as I talk through this, is that it's about how you think. And there's a fantastic book called uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck. And what it does, you can Google there's some good articles that, that they'll summarize this, even the TED Talk. The difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. And so um, you can be fixed and get to a growth, but you gotta know what the difference is. So growth means I can go learn anything. Oh, there's something new, I can figure that out. That's just a mindset. But we all know people that will say, oh yeah, that's not my thing, I can't do that. I can't do this, I can't do that. So you're fixed and you think you can only do that one thing, but a growth mindset, give me the next challenge. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, I've heard you know, several stats around it, but um, anywhere between two to 5% of the population is growth. Most are fixed. 
okay. which is crazy. Yeah. And it still blows my mind. So you, you got to think about if it's that low, how many, most people aren't going to take the next challenge and go for it. And so you, that's probably one of the things you hear about me. And I didn't know that's what it was called or what I was, that's what I was doing back in the day. But any challenge, I run toward it. So back to incident response, and this, this is pivotal for me in my, my life and career. So, you know, it's pretty interesting. So working for McAfee, I kind of had three businesses. So we had the incident response business globally. Then I had the Foundstone assessment and penetration test business. Then we also had um, the McAfee deployment installation. Okay, so there were some customers where we would go in, install the McAfee EPO, whatever you know, products they bought, and get it set up. <clears throat> then we would actually um, come and do their assessment or pen test. Then we would come back uh, if they had an incident and do the incident. Now these CISOs uh, and, and, and CEOs in these companies, when they had these incidents, I got yelled at so many times. But here's why. They bought all these products from us. We did all these assessments and gave them all these strategic roadmaps and everything else. And they just could not connect the dots why they had to pay me and my team 400 bucks an hour. And they bought all the products. We came in dead and we like, didn't we do everything right? I was like, well, unfortunately, the software uh, that you, you bought and the hardware we put in is not actually designed to stop the attack. It's designed to detect it and then respond to it. Now, some things will be stopped, like you know, kind of the low-hanging fruit. So when you think about the cybersecurity industry as a whole, are we actually trying to stop these attacks or are we just trying to detect them? Because what we had to do and kind of what your experience was, we got really, really good at how do we find the malware? Once we found the malware, then we can submit the sample really quickly, had a direct line to submit it uh, mm -hmm. and get a signature sent back, like literally sometimes within hours. Then we push that out and incident resolved. But if you think about it, that's not actually stopping the attack. You know, the attack has actually happened. The malware is already run. Uh, the threat actors have potentially even um, escalated privileges. So we got yelled at a lot in some very, very big incidents. And then sometimes, I remember one time, it, it took us like a couple months to find all the malware. And so it, um, it became a really complicated thing. And it just made us feel like we were failing with incident response, but that's the best we could do at the time. And I remember those days because, I mean, I, I felt really good because I was learning a lot of stuff at the time. Yeah. Because everything did hit the desktop, and of course, it was, but everything was, re you were reacting, you're constantly reacting. Uh -huh. You were always behind the curve, and uh, a lot of stuff, including my company, had to deal with worms back then, and, uh -huh. you know, it, worms were not pretty, like real worms, right. and I'm glad that's right. kind of died down. But now we've kind of moved into a new area, uh -huh. and that's, an, uh, it took the industry a long time to adjust from a file placed on your machine to living off the land type of attacks mm -hmm. you know where there's no artifacts and then all of a sudden things you got to start to learn in memory forensics and all these type of things and so it completely changed and i never forget how long it took people to adapt their mm -hmm. mindset and then for people to adapt their mindset from this some kid in their basement who doesn't have anything else to do right to finally understand that hey these are cyber criminals and then even with phishing attacks like yeah uh, these are not, the typos are not there by accident, they're intentional because they're mm -hmm. targeting a specific demographic of people yep. who are not really observant. Yep. So they're not wasting their time with people who are very you know, adept. They're looking for the people who make mistakes, the people mm -hmm. who are emotional and rational. So we're in this whole new area of cybersecurity. But looking at a chart, uh, your presentation I posted on Twitter, um, we're, we're, we're losing. We have more technology okay. now than we ever right. have before, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but the amount of t attacks are increasing. Yep. The amount of money and revenue for criminals that they're breaking in is increasing. Yeah. It looks like we're, t I mean, it's a bloodbath. Yeah. So what, what do we do? What, how does this end? Yeah. It, it's interesting, right? Think of it this way. Um, there was some, uh, stats out there. Um, Dark side, you know, they do a bunch of ransomware, Russian hacker group. They make a hundred million a year. Okay. So that's not bad. Yeah, exactly. So, and ransomware as a service is out there. Um, it, it, all this is automated. 
Like, you don't have to be a smart hacker in your basement to figure this stuff out. You can go literally download the toolkit. All you gotta do is really supply the email addresses and you can get that from anywhere, a list of email and just blast away, okay? So ransomware has turned automated. You think about all the things we do in the business world where we've automated, same thing have happened, has happened in cybersecurity. So um, the hackers have gotten way smarter. And I think the challenge is, is like you said, we're not evolving and pivoting fast enough. And it, 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 I don't, people, I think some of these hackers don't even see themselves as malicious or bad people because they're, they see it as their business. It's so quick and transactional to drop some ransomware or, or hack in and, and then specifically drop some ransomware. I'm going to tell you exactly how that happens because it's pretty interesting. I think people don't realize that ransomware isn't just malware. It is a hack. Originally it was. You, like, you accidentally clicked on something and then it got encrypted and you had one system. What happened is the hackers realized we're not getting paid. They're like, we're not getting paid because people are like, oh, screw it, I got backups. Or people are like, oh, well, okay, I'll just you know, not use that system anymore and just start over. So again, it's a business. They started changing their techniques. And when people call it ransomware today, I, it, it's, it's, it's misleading because it's not that. It actually is a hack. So to stop the hack, um, one of the things that I, I talk a lot about is you got to have you know, seven basic things in place. And, and I'll go through that really quickly because it's important. You gotta have MFA, multi-factor authentication, number one. Okay, that's the first thing you have to do. And there are a lot of people, they don't even have it on their banks. Their personal bank accounts, they're not even using multi-factor authentication. Um, and Can I just go on record? Yeah. Very disturbing that my bank, I don't, I still think my bank doesn't have an option for MFA. Yeah, I switched banks. <laughs> yeah, anyway, my, I had a bank. They didn't have it for a long time. I switched everything in my life is multi-factor authentication. Because here's the thing. The hackers, we have your passwords. The pen testers have your password. We have, just assume your password is compromised. So imagine you know, it was a very, very large incident I was doing and at a company that we probably all use and I saw the passwords were exfiltrated. And I was like, well, okay, my password's gone. And, and so I've seen that actually a few times. So I want everybody to think about your password's gone. Even if it's a complicated password, super long, they have it, okay? Because back in my day, we used to use rainbow tables that we could get to access the password really quickly. Um, we could, you know, crack it, you know, pretty quickly. I always had that cracking server and all that. But now it's, it's you know, your password's out there. Um, we can, uh, computing power is increased, so you, you can actually crack it much faster. Or the easiest way is to fish you. Because everybody posts things on social media. Like right now, I'm in Miami. And so if somebody were like, oh, Corey's in Miami, and crafted up something, hey, I just saw your talk at, you know, Secure in Miami, and, um, you know, why don't you click this link to check out your ratings, your score or something? You know, not that I would click on it, but they have so much intel about what you're doing in your life that they can make it very specific. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to click. And so <clears throat> the challenge is, is that your passwords are gone. So you need multi-factor authentication in everything in your business. What's great about it, and I say this a lot you know, to, to our clients, uh, we have you know, what I call poor man's multi-factor authentication. If you're a newer company and you're using you know, the cloud and Office 365 and AWS and Slack and all these things, it's built in, it's enabled. So you can just turn it on and yes, you know, using you know, the, the, the text messaging that can be spoofed. But if somebody's doing that, then you've got a more sophisticated you know, threat actor coming for you. Uh, and so, um, that's a low-hanging fruit type of thing if you don't fix the password issue. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is, ties back to antivirus. Antivirus was created about 30 years ago. You know, our buddy, you know, you know, John McAfee, as crazy as he, he was, you know, God rest his soul. But I, why would we expect 30-year-old technology to protect us today? Yeah. But people are still using really, really basic antivirus. Yeah. And, and the, it, it actually blows my mind. There's, there's two pieces to it. One, your antivirus has to actually be able to see the malware and stop it from executing. 
because if your antivirus only looks at the, the malware and then after it executes and then sends you an alert or you got to chase a signature, that doesn't make sense. And, and I know a lot about, you know, obviously um, antivirus and how it works. Think about this. All the malware that's ever created, they cannot have a signature on everybody's computer. It won't fit, right? No, it wouldn't. <laughs> it's just, you cannot have hashes for all that. So what they have is just the most common stuff the last few years. So you potentially have some really bad malware from 10 years ago. It might not even see it. And we've seen that malware, old malware yeah. resurfaces and exactly. reach out, yes. Exactly. So that doesn't work. Number one, you cannot you don't have a detect and response strategy around, around your um, um, antivirus because one is potentially won't see it. And I strongly recommend getting an AI-based version of the antivirus that's going to be able to see it. Now, here's the other big, you know, you know, catch to it. People will have these, you can have the best you know, AI-based anti, antivirus, but if you don't actually configure it to block the attack uh -huh. and stop the execution, then it's still going to execute. You'll see it and it'll send you this amazing alert. Oh, you got ransomware on this system. And then a second later, it's encrypted. So you actually have to do both. Be able to detect it and have it configured to actually block the attack. Okay. And, and it, it actually blows my mind. I used to, um, back in the day, when um, intrusion prevention systems came out. Okay. Um, a lot of the companies were like, oh, the next thing in cybersecurity, we're going to get these intrusion prevention systems. Um, but... Before that was intrusion detection systems. Uh -huh. So they'd have IDS, yes. and those, those IDSs, you know, everybody put them in, and they'd just send you an alert and tell you that you know, something is happening. But then you had the intrusion prevention systems. Mm -hmm. No one actually configured it to prevent. Yes, because <laughs> everybody was scared of pretty much doing a denial of service attack on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, but it's a, you just, it, I've tuned them. You got to tune them and you got to monitor them. And now technology's gotten way, way better. But the same thing with antivirus. Like you, we're not configuring them to stop the attack. So you're not actually trying to stop a ransomware attack. The other thing is if you aren't continually scanning and, and patching, there are new vulnerabilities that come out every single day, right? So mm -hmm. if you're not scanning every single day, you don't know about them. Mm -hmm. And if you're not continually patching your systems on a continuous basis, you're not going to fix them. So there, there are some you know, um, you know, vulnerabilities that you can just get Metasploit and there's a bunch of tools out there. You can simply get a command prompt, scan it, oh, it's vulnerable to that, run it against the, that certain IP address, next thing you know, you got a command prompt, you're done. Yeah. You can learn to do that in, what, 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Anybody can be a hacker in 10 minutes, a so script <laughs> kitty. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Not hard to do, but most companies are not patching. They don't have the proper antivirus. They do not have uh, it configured right. They don't have multi-factor authentication. They don't um, have a way to um, know exactly what IT assets they have. Yes. Like I've seen it so many times. I've been called in for an incident, and they're like, yeah, we didn't know we had that server on the internet. We didn't know it existed. Um, think about Equifax. Mm -hmm. They had a server sitting on the internet, not patched, um, got exported, and then eventually they got all the way into their internal network and exfiltrated pretty much all of our um, you know, personal data. And anybody that's ever done incident response, that is the noisiest thing. That what I just described to you to go from the DMZ to the internal network and exfiltrate that much data. If you're looking for the right things, you will see that. Uh, most companies again aren't even looking for the right things. So, you know, in summary, we talk about ransomware and the hack of ransomware. No one's really trying to stop it because the industry is primarily trying to just detect it. But when you detect something and you immediately encrypt it, then it's game over. Mm -hmm. So the industry is really, really behind. We need a new way to do cybersecurity because the old way is not working anymore. Well, uh, to me, the way I think of the cybersecurity industry right now is, is you have your, your white hats who are, or let's say your patching routine. Let's just not, let's not even talk about black hat, white hat, and all that stuff. Let's say you, you have your corporations and you have your legitimate companies mm -hmm. and they're an athlete and they're a track athlete and they train once a month, your patching cycle, right? Mm -hmm. You do your, your, your scans, your penetration testing once a year. So yeah. you, you go to the track and you run once a year yeah. for that one. And so you think about all the routines we have once a month, once a year, mm -hmm. every two weeks, but then you have the bad guys. Yeah. And by the way, the bad guys, it's not just another team, it's thousands mm -hmm. of individual 
teams and groups mm -hmm. who are training every day for mm -hmm. a specific purpose to yep. defeat people like you. Yeah. You can't win that scenario. You cannot. They're, yeah. they're better, faster, smarter, and, uh, and they only have to be successful, right? I, I love this statement a long time ago to say, we have to win every time. This is what law enforcement said. We have to win every time. Yeah. They just have to win one time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, 100%. And, and what I've been you know, preaching for the last, last few years, cybersecurity is, is hygiene. We have to think of it as hygiene. Because I, I love your analogy, you know, that's another one that I can kind of put in my quiver as I, I talk about this. But I, I use the, the, the worst ones. When we think about, imagine if I didn't brush my teeth this morning. Mm -hmm. I did it my once a year, I brushed my teeth. That's like a pen test. I did mm -hmm. it once a year, I'm good, right? Mm -hmm. I put deodorant on once a year, I'm good, right? <laughs> so that's what we think with cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Like we do it like once a month, once a year, but it's something that needs to happen on a continuous basis. Mm -hmm. But the construct of how we uh, protect ourselves and our companies isn't built that way. And we have a shortage of IT you know, you know, staff and expertise, and so we can't keep up with the hackers. Mm -hmm. But I actually challenge that. I think we can if we shift the way we think. Because you know, today we have, have um, you know, the cloud managed software, there's a lot of automation that can be put in place that allows us to continually protect you know, companies and continually scan and continually patch and have a continuous process around how, how it's done. But we absolutely have to rethink that to actually get there. Mm -hmm. So for those that are maybe watching this video that want to get in cybersecurity, because there, I've always hit the discussion about the jobs and the number of jobs that are open in, in, in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. but I do know that those jobs are open because cybersecurity, people who are hiring cybersecurity professionals don't just hire people and retrofit them. They're looking for people who already have the skill set. Yeah. Because I know a lot of people that are trying to get in yeah. and they're continually being told no. Yeah. So how do you fix the scenario? Say, we want somebody that's already trained. Mm -hmm. There are not enough trained unicorns available. Yep. People who want to get in can do training or basic level of training, but are getting denied. Yeah. It seems like a broken system. So you're correct. Um, here's the problem. The way we hire in cybersecurity, we're looking for, we need an expert that's good at this, 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 and this. And so what I started to do is instead of saying, I need this person to know everything, I, I, I look for the hustle. Okay. And I think hiring managers need to get much better at looking for the hustle. Because um, I, can, I can think of many, many you know, candidates I can hire, that I hired over the years. One in particular at uh, Foundstone, he ended up being you know, my, my you know, practice lead and ran the incident response practice and helped me build it. But in the interview, he had just gotten his forensic certification and, and was doing a bunch of stuff at home, just kind of learning. But the whole interview, he's like this. He's leaned in. I'm like, this guy is going to come across this table <laughs> and, and, and just go. He's ready to go. Yeah.